SBC Media. Welcome to iGaming Daily, analysing the news from the betting and gaming industry all over the globe. Supported by SBC Summit Barcelona, the industry-leading conference bringing you the future of sports betting and iGaming. SBC Summit Barcelona is where you can experience the global industry coverage under one roof. Expect an industry-leading conference agenda covering all verticals across seven stages, a huge trade show floor filled with over 3,000 exhibitors, and luxury networking events at premium venues in one of Europe's coolest cities. Join 10,000 executives this September at the event drawing the industry's eyes. Get your tickets now at sbcevents.com. Responding to political pressures, the Premier League has revised its relationship with betting and gambling. From the season 2027 to 2028 onwards, Premier League clubs will ensure sponsorship with gambling operators, terminating what accounts for a reported 60 plus million relationship per annum. Yet, beyond club finances, will the end of betting sponsorships be even noticed by the football audiences? As reported by SBC, last week the digital data agency Horizon highlighted the low engagement generated by bookmakers paying multi-million pound sponsorships compared to the other sectors. What does betting's low digital value tell us about its relationship with football clubs as the industry begins its long farewell with the top tier of English football? I'm James Ross and today I am joined by two guests making their iGaming daily debuts. Hi, I'm Jesse Sale and I'm a senior journalist at SPC News. And I'm George Harborn. I'm Director of Sponsorship for uh, SBC Sponsorship Division. Perfect. Welcome to you both. I hope you have a great debut. I think you're going to smash it out of the park. What was your first reaction of the new story? I was somewhat surprised. I think I've always considered digital value as something of importance and perhaps betting has been built up as something of massive value to football and sports when the report does suggest it has lacked quite significantly in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And George, what was your reaction to it? No, I'm, I'm not shocked by it, to be honest with you. I think, I think what we have to remember is, and I guess it's kind of a broader, a broader piece to talk about as we, as we touch on some of the tri- subjects we're going to talk about. But I think we have to try and get a, a bit of a view of why these deals are done in the first place. And if you look at the operators that are mainly sponsoring in the Premier League, especially when they're on the front of the shirt, most of them are focused on Asian markets or at least overseas markets. And the Premier League is, is pretty unique in the sense that it only has one broadcast feed that goes out globally. So the Premier League is the, I guess, one of the most effective methods of reaching multiple markets, particularly in that Asia region, as I said. And as a result of that, when it comes to digital engagement, it's particularly domestically, it just isn't a priority. Uh, I guess, for these types of deals or, or or is unlikely to be a priority because the target markets aren't the UK. So not hugely shocked, um, but look, still, I think it highlights again that kind of the disconnect between what some of these partnerships, you know, the, the number of these partnerships and what they're looking to achieve in the UK. Mm-hmm. And George, I'll just stick with you for a second. The term digital engagement for the uh, for some of the audience members or listeners who don't know, can you just clarify what that actually is? Well, I think it can depend. I think, you know, digital engagement could mean, um, could could just be a simpler, and it depends based on what, uh, what uh, an operator values, right? So an operator might value digital engagement as being uh, just reach metrics. So how many people have seen my post? Digital engagement for another operator may be, well, actually, I want to see a certain number of, of uh, true engagements and engagements might mean post likes or or click throughs on links so i don't think it's as straightforward to say what is digital engagement uh, especially in this context of, of of sponsorship because depending on what an operator is is looking to achieve and that and this isn't just stick for this industry but the the gambling industry by the way it, i think this goes across any sponsorship agreement um i think it will be determined by the objectives that are that are being set aside at the beginning of any relationship. Perfect. And Jesse, can you just provide us a breakdown of the relevant industry findings? 
Yeah, sure. So I think perhaps betting and gaming isn't actually as valuable as football as we once thought. There are a lot of arguments presented throughout the Gambling Act review about betting's financial support for football. And the BGC has often reiterated the £40 million figure for the EFL, for example. Horizons report doesn't dispute that betting companies provide this value through their sponsorship fees. But what it does argue is that partnering with other sectors may be more beneficial to the sport in other ways, like through social media and digital engagement. For example, so Horizon revealed that over the last 12 months, Bournemouth's sponsorship with Daffabet only generated around £5,000 in total digital value. So I think that's quite surprising, whereas partnerships with alternative companies like EA Sports and Noon have provided significant digital value to clubs like Newcastle and Fulham. I think the Newcastle and Noon deal had a digital value of just under £200,000, so that's quite a big difference, I think. Mm-hmm. Definitely considering how much these clubs, well, these companies actually sponsor clubs and the amount they pay for the shirt sponsorships themselves. Yeah, exactly. It is quite a, um, a staggering statistic. George, is there anything from the findings that you thought was a bit eye-opening? No, I, again, like, not not hugely. I think it's interesting to see how well Nunes performed um, in, in the context of the gambling relationships that we're talking about, just because... Um, and I'm making a massive assumption here, but I'm assuming that Noon is targeting an overseas audience. Um, so that overseas audience, you know, the, the argument that the gambling operators are targeting overseas audiences kind of falls apart at that point, just because Noon is also doing exactly the same thing. Um, with some of the other sponsorships that we see performing well, it, it's not surprising because, like I've said already, they are, their objectives will be to drive some sort of um, call to action or some description where, again, I think with a lot of the betting partnership agreements, um, it it becomes about mass awareness, mass visibility, uh, credibility as well, in which case those digital elements aren't really as important as, um, you know, just the branding on kit or the branding around the pitch and those sorts of things. So, yeah, I guess that would be my take on it. Mm -hmm. And George, how... When it comes to betting sponsorships, have they kind of become simple in their formula as a marketing practice? You know, has, has it just become a bit too straightforward? I think in the Premier League, I think you're absolutely right. You know, they are a bit formulaic. It's It does tend to be about the awareness assets rather than the other bits and pieces. But, um, and again, I think this plays into this whole, what is the Premier League as an asset? And it's different to, La Liga or Serie A or, or any other league in the world for that matter when it comes to football because as I've mentioned already it's got that single broadcast feed and the other leagues don't have that the other leagues have um, broadcast feeds that can be segmented by geography and what that means for the Premier League is is that as I mentioned already you know if if you're a brand that wants to target different regions globally the Premier League all of a sudden becomes um, you know not least not least because it's one of the most viewed leagues and sports competitions in the world, but it all of a sudden becomes one of those places where you go to and go, well, actually, I can tick a lot of objectives objectives off by uh, by partnering with teams in in that league. Whereas, you know, in with other leagues that and and, and in countries where sponsorship has been banned, you know, you can have far more kind of true and meaningful and genuine regional partnerships. That doesn't really exist in the UK. Whereas if we look to the championship, I don't think it's necessarily as formulaic. I think if we wind the clock back maybe five years, there was a lot more activation taking place in that league. Um, and there were more genuine partnerships. I think we've lost a little bit of that, but I think we've lost a little bit of that in you know local market activation because of the white paper that's been hanging over the industry for the last few years. There's definitely been a drop in. Um, the value of partnerships that were getting done in uh, in the championship and also the volume of partnerships that were getting done in that league over the last few years because, you know, uh, and you guys know, uh, because we've had to report on it at SBC, like we've been looking at it, we, we've been hearing that this white paper has been coming for God knows how long. It's finally arrived. And actually, I don't think the consequences to for sponsorship in the UK are, are particularly strong. So we may then, we may now see a bit of an uptick in, in that sort of stuff happening. So, Formulaic in the Premier League, I think probably yes. I think they are a little bit formulaic. And I think that formula is based on exposure. And if, because most of the brands that that you'll see on the shirts are targeting overseas markets, but I don't think that means that it's formulaic as a whole, as an industry. I certainly don't think that's the case. I think the industry works really hard 
and does some great stuff uh, and some great activations um, when it needs to and when it's targeting a local market. I'm going to mention something now. I don't know if it's true. I don't know where I've seen this. It might just have been a social media thing. George, this is for you. Um, so I don't know how accurate this is. But with the Premier League, you've, you're at the ground, you get the sponsorships going around the stadium on the um, advertising boards. When they're electronic, does that change depending on which country you're watching it from? Not in the Premier League, and that's that's what I mean about a single broadcast feed. So when you when you partner with somebody in the UK, you're partnering with them all over the world uh, for the Premier League. You know, you might have activation rights to a specific territory. So, yeah, you can only use uh, intellectual property in a certain region. But in terms of the adverts themselves, they'll be seen in every market around the world, and that's the difference. And that's why I referenced the Italian teams and the Spanish teams, where you know those those local domestic you know you, you if you're in a stadium in spain you will not see a betting advert because it's not allowed and the same in italy however if we're watching la liga here in the uk we will because the spanish broadcast feed is different to the broadcast feed that reaches europe is different to the broadcast feed that reaches latin america is different to the broadcast feed which reaches asia um and that's i think that's a big difference yeah, I agree with what George said. I think going back to the Premier League, if you look at the history of them over the past few years, maybe they have become a little bit copy and paste, a little bit repetitive. Um, partnerships that are looking to innovate the most are using digital efforts and assets as opposed to just front of shirt sponsorship. Perhaps the Premier League shift away from the prominence of these deals will prompt operators to be a bit more creative. Mm-hmm. And sticking with you, Jesse, how are sponsorship deals structured between clubs and operators? Ultimately, varies from deal to deal. Some clubs have multiple betting sponsors, e.g. front of shirt sponsor and another gaming sponsor who gets LED advertising. Durations can also vary. Some last for just one season, others go on longer. You've also got some which include social media and content creation elements. So it ultimately depends on how much the operator's marketing budget can cover and what the club is willing to work with them on, give away or what marketing space they have available. Mm -hmm. And George, this is a kind of also your expertise field and sponsorship. Is there anything else to add to that? Is there any other kind of behind the scenes you want to kind of reveal to us on how clubs and operators work together? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the Premier League, I think you'd sometimes find, certainly in recent years, it's it, maybe not in the maybe not in the summer just gone. A lot of the deals a lot of the deals will get done in the summer leading into a season. So in the summer just gone, there was probably less new entries coming into the market than we've probably ordinarily had in previous years. But certainly in years where there's been a lot of brands trying to come into the Premier League at the same time, you'll see teams carry multiple betting partners. Um, and as Jesse rightly says, you'll you'll see one on the front of the shirt. You'll probably then see another two or three as partners of the club. Um, you then will have um, betting companies that are purchasing LED packages through one of the agencies that operates in the UK. Um, so, you know, you could end up with five or six brands on an, uh, on an LED system around the pitch, um, as, as a culmination of, you know, shirt partner, another type of couple of, couple of partnerships with the club. And then also the advertising from an, an LED package that they've purchased. Um, so I guess there's uh, a, a few different ways of, uh, of kind of coming to it from there. Um, I think what's more important really is kind of how, in terms of how these deals are struck, is a lot of these brands will already have a predetermined idea of some of the assets that they want, particularly if they're overseas facing. You know, it's going to be heavy on um, advertising inventory. It's going to be heavy on LED num uh, number of LED minutes. It's going to be heavy on if they can get kit branding or training wear branding or um, backdrop branding and those sorts of things. That isn't to kind of tarnish everyone with the same brush because there are brands, uh, as we know, that do want to do that local market activation. And that's when, you know, as Jesse's rightly said, there'll be more innovative approaches to, you know, utilizing player access and, and social media um, content and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's probably worth saying that even some of those kind of overseas focused brands are still using those assets. We just probably don't see them over here um, because they're using them for their kind of target markets. Mm -hmm. And George mentioned this earlier when relating to the white paper that there was a bit of a slowdown in terms of, certainly in the EFL, in terms of um, operators' partnerships. But Jesse, I'm going to come to you for this question first. Does sponsorship work in a saturated market such as the US, uh, not the US, sorry, for the UK, uh, when it comes to betting and gambling? 
I think it must have some impact because of how extensive the sponsorship are throughout the English football system. At the end of the day, operators wouldn't keep coming back to it as a marketing method if it didn't have an impact on player engagement. Um, some studies have suggested that the LED board aspects of deals do tend to have the most impact, though. Mm-hmm. No, that makes sense, considering how prominent they are on the, on the screen throughout the whole game. Yeah. Um, George, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think I think Jesse's I think Jesse's right. You know, from a, from an exposure point of view, you know the the relationship between sport and gambling's you know, one of those as old as time. So, you know, you want your brand to be seen in the context of a sporting event because it gives it credibility, it puts it front of mind and, and all the rest of it. Um, I think I think the partnerships work. Um, I've seen them work in in the past when I've had, a, when I've been working at clubs. And I think there's some really good examples of um, brands who've activated very, very well domestically. But I think you do have to go down the divisions to see that. I don't think you'll find a huge number of those in the Premier League just because of the nature of what the Premier League partnerships tend to be um, trying to achieve, which is, that I'll say, that kind of mass global exposure um, piece. Whereas if you're partnering in the EFL, you don't have that that international platform um, and therefore you are genuinely more domestically focused. You know, you, you'll be hyper-local strategies for activation um, and again, I guess in the last few years, we've seen brands do that particularly well. So, and as Jesse says, the brands wouldn't be coming back to it time and time again if it wasn't effective. And I know we're focused on the UK right now in, in this conversation in the Premier League, but we only have to look overseas to some of the other markets and see the proliferation of gambling sponsorships in the likes of Brazil at the moment. Um, increasingly in other Latin American markets where, you know, a lot of these organizations are European based that are going into overseas markets and that that's learned they've learned the success of those partnerships from um from their core markets in europe and then exporting those methods into overseas territories so it, yeah it clearly has a benefit perfect and just to round off the podcast you mentioned earlier in the intro that the premier league will be banning gambling sponsorship from 2027 to 2028 season well, that's when it'll start is this kind of the beginning of the end for betting's relationship with the premier league I think you can't say for definite just yet. Um, obviously, the Premier League's own vote on the matter, like you said, set out 2026-27 as the first season without front of shirt sponsors. And even then, sleeve shirts will continue. The league clearly sees partnerships with the industry as good for revenue, regardless of reports around things like digital value. But development with the biggest implication will be whether the government decides to change its course on sponsorship and enforce a breaking of ties completely. And George, any last thing to say? Yeah, I think I think there's probably two things really. I think number one, um, completely agree with Jesse on you know where where and what the government decide to do long term. You know because the clubs then ultimately in the league are in are kind of in the lap of what the government choose to do. I think the other thing to mention is you know when we talk about the Premier League banning, um, the Premier League is made up of the stakeholders, which are the clubs. So the it's the clubs that have come to this collective decision to stop taking. Uh, gambling sponsorship on the shirts and I think I think the word banning is quite strong in, in, given that context I think you know we, we have to see it as an elective decision taken by the clubs because they see it as the best thing for you know the league themselves the fans that are watching um, the games both domestically and overseas um, and and the impact that that then has on other opportunities that sit within the club so I don't think I don't think it's anywhere near the end, to be perfectly honest. And I think even if we do see a domestic banning of sponsorship opportunities in the future, we'll just see a reversion to the types of um, the types of structures that we have in La Liga and Serie A and in other in other leagues across Europe. But where and we've kind of t- already touched on this, where you'll see technology implemented to continue to have those relationships between clubs and operators. But we probably just won't see them here in the UK. They'll be they'll be t- more targeted to overseas territories through the broadcast feeds. So maybe maybe a shift in the UK if the government enforces that, but certainly not an end in the relationship between the gambling industry and Premier League football clubs. And it, moving forward, if there is any developments on anything related to sports sponsorship, be sure to check out uh, SBC's website, insidersports.com, um, where Joe Streeter and his team will be keeping the viewers up to date as soon as the news breaks and also on sbcnews.co.uk where Jesse will also be keeping everyone up to date. 
For the listeners out there, I will be attaching Jesse's article on Horizon to the description below. So go and check it out. And George and Jesse, well done. Great debuts. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Welcome. And for our listeners out there, thank you. Goodbye. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. See ya. Thank you for listening to today's episode of iGaming Daily, brought to you in conjunction with SBC Summit Barcelona, being held at the Fira Barcelona Monduic on the 19th to the 21st of September. If you want to find out more about some of the subjects raised today, feel free to explore any of the sites in the SBC News Network or check out the latest edition of the SBC Leaders magazine. Happy reading.